Okay, well, thank you so much for this invitation. Um, I've, I, I tried to, to, to stay with the conference for as long as I could yesterday um, and, and, and gave up somewhere around 1 a.m. So <laughs> um, it's the, the, time, the time difference is, is strange and fascinating, um, and, and I'm sure the weather difference is, is even more so, and, and it would be lovely to actually be in Singapore with you. Um, but but I hope that that what I have to say sort of connects at least with with some of what you've what you're you know so wonderfully excitingly working on, um, and and so before I start my my talk proper, I just wanted to sort of try and connect a little bit with, with what some of you have been thinking about and talking about um, in the, over the last day and a bit. Um, that that I think what I want to try and do is identify a problem which um, you can call haunting, but I think really to think about. Um, I would argue in some ways, and I will argue that in some ways medicine is is a haunting practice that I think I think um, it's almost impossible not to be what I will define as haunted in some ways. Um, but to think that the suffering that 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 might cause uh, physicians is is the problem that we're looking at. And one of the questions would be to how to alleviate that suffering. Um, and 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 the starting point would be to find the cause of that, and I'm going to argue something like the cause of the suffering that we can call haunting hauntedness um, is a failure to acknowledge how weird medicine is weird. Um, and another way to think about that is to think about how the art and science, as Dr. Curran was saying earlier, how the the art part of medicine, whatever you whatever you think of it uh, of that term meaning, um, has been neglected. Um, and another way to think about that is how medicine, how, how, how physicians, particularly healthcare providers, but I will be thinking very specifically about the training of physicians, has tended to view uncertainty and emotion as failures rather than as in inevitable parts of, of medicine. And, and then the third part, obviously, is the response to that problem, which I will unsurprisingly argue may be the medical humanities um, and, and including the humanities in medical education at for at all levels in a, a more substantial way, which I suspect many of you, most of you will agree with. Um, and we can think at, at the end and maybe in the question time a bit more about what that might really look like. Okay, um, so I've been, oh, and I should say, um, I have no conflicts of interest in giving this talk. Um, no pharmaceutical companies are paying me or anything. Um, and so here we go. I started thinking about the question of, of haunting in medicine or, or mostly just noticing the word haunting and how often it, it comes up um, in, in, in discussions about, about doctors um, in, in 2019. Um, and it was, and, and then of course everything changed in many ways. Um, and so, so the, the, the COVID pandemic has led to, um, I think, armies of ghosts for just about anyone involved in healthcare in any way, which has ended up to kind of mean just about anyone. Um, and so I adjusted some of the thinking based on, on, on COVID um, that hadn't been part of my initial thinking for this talk. So um, I will begin there. I ha I've been thinking for a while about the suffering of medical professionals, by which I mean the distresses that can lead to traumatized states, states often described as burnout. And I've been thinking about how the suffering might be connected, what I've gradually come to think about as the weirdness of medicine. And we'll come back to what precisely weird means, but I wondered how doctor's suffering might be connected to medicine's disavowal. You could even say it's repression of its own weirdness. And I noticed how the suffering is very often described as a sense of being haunted. So I'll start with an example. In 2020, an infectious disease specialist named Dr. Suraj Sagar told a reporter about how one of his patients asked him, my, there we go, sorry about that, how one of his patients asked him, doctor, do you really think I have COVID? And notice this, is, this was published in April, um, of 2020. So this was early on. At that point, Dr. Sagar wasn't sure what the patient had. So he told the patient that they were being extra cautious by hospitalizing him. About 10 years, uh, 10 days later, the patient who did turn out to have the coronavirus was dead. That still haunts me, Dr. Sagar said in this interview. 
We can't tell exactly what haunts Dr. Sagar. Is it the death of his patient? Or is it his inability 10 days earlier to have said for certain whether the patient was infected with the new coronavirus? Probably the two merge so that for him, the sadness and horror that we all feel when a person we know suddenly dies is inseparable from a particular guilty grief he feels as a doctor, not simply for being unable to save this life, but also for not having had the secure knowledge to give his patient a confident and definitive answer. No one blames him for any of this. He did not give a false answer, and it's unlikely that he could have done anything better, but he still feels that dead patient's question as a persistent reproach. As he says, it haunts him. To haunt a place means to frequent it, showing up repeatedly even after you're no longer expected or welcome. In ghost stories, apparitions of the dead are not easily banished from haunted houses. And I should have mentioned, I don't know if you noticed um, the caption to this photograph that I've used throughout, um, is um, it, it's, it's a room in a hospital, a deserted hospital in England, which um, is, is uh, believed to be haunted. Um, in any case, I think it's, it's rather beautiful um, in, a, in, a, in a sublime ruins kind of way. Um, so in ghost stories, apparitions of the dead are not easily banished from haunted houses or haunted hospitals. By analogy, people can be haunted too. For example, remorseful thoughts keep troubling the conscience of a guilty person. And we use the ter term haunted for situations where we wish something could have been laid to rest with resolution and closure, but instead it keeps coming back. In ghost stories, spirits usually cannot rest in peace because there is something that has not been completed. They often seek revenge, but sometimes they just need some other kind of recognition. If the meaning of our lives, construed as stories, lies in the ending of the story, then ghosts are stories with unsatisfactory endings. Stories seeking a narrator with the insight to give them meaning. The problem is that clinical medicine, dependent on facts and distrustful of emotion, has trouble with meaning. The words haunted and haunting appear surprisingly often in discourse about medicine. Surprisingly, that is, if we think of haunting as supernatural or fictitious, and of medicine as the rational application of observable data derived by scientific methods. And of course it is that, but I would argue that it's more than that. But haunting may be a particularly fitting me metaphor for the experience of healthcare professionals and trainees who suffer from unresolved regret or sorrow about past clinical events. And in the, in the, the rest of the talk, very often I'll be talking about the deaths of patients, um, because that's where this comes up most often. I do want to be clear that uh, patients dying are not only and, and certainly not always the cause of the sense of, of haunting. Many other kinds of events can have the same effect. But I'll go a step further. I'll say that this feeling for which so many clinicians have chosen the word haunted may reveal that the boundaries between ghost stories and medical knowledge are more permeable than they might seem. Signaling, signaling an epistemological question that demands to be heard. Doctors' work is, in several senses, weird, and medicine might benefit from paying closer attention to the etiologies and the manifestations of its ghosts. So to go back, later that year of 2020, a palliative care physician called Dr. Richard Leiter wrote about his complicated response to the lull that came after the pandemic's first wave in Boston, where he was working. Um, and he starts writing about this experience with good news. And this was the, in the, the New England Journal of Medicine, um, one of their perspective pieces. He begins with the good news. We did it, I told myself. We made it to the other side. I was wholly unprepared for what came next. The weeks since Boston temporarily beat back COVID have been more difficult than I ever expected. When I fall asleep, I'm haunted by memories of patients I cared for, but never met. I can't remember their names, but I also can't forget their stories. I've also felt a growing sense of anger and resentment as our hospital has slowly been returning to its new normal. Leiter captures the complexity 
both emotional and cognitive of what we call haunting, and what he calls haunting. He can't forget the patients and what happened to them, but he also can't remember important things about them, like their names. And he's supposed to feel relieved, but instead he feels anger and resentment. As he says, I'm left with the skeletons of guilt and regret. Skeletons are not exactly ghosts. They're related Halloween figures, but they're also the shameful secrets that we hide in our proverbial closets. Unlike ghosts, they're determinedly hidden, so they can't tell us what they need. If, if a ghost is actively haunting you, as the stories go, they'll, they'll tell you what you're supposed to do, right? They'll throw things around. Um, but of course, Dr. Leiter is, in writing this piece, exposing the skeletons. In other words, these skeletons are not in the closet. He's writing about them. We can read about them. And this part, the telling and the writing, is important. And we'll come back to it. So what does it mean to be haunted and what does it mean to claim that medicine is weird? In his study of the literature of the weird, Mark Fisher gives us a useful, very simple definition. He says the weird is that which does not belong. Here's the word being used by a medical student to describe the aftermath of experiencing a patient's death for the first time. The student says, the rest of the day, I'm sorry, I seem to have a piece, sorry, there you go. The student, this is after experiencing a patient's death, the student says the rest of the day was really weird. It was very surreal. I and a fellow student felt it was just the craziest thing we've ever seen. We haven't been around any death at all. The language is telling here, a patient dies in the hospital. How is it that this event should be experienced by anyone caring for that patient, not simply as sad or thought provoking, but as weird and surreal and crazy? as that which does not belong. Not because death should never happen, but because the student has not learned to expect that it will happen. The weird isn't only that which does not belong in a place, but also in an epistemological system. As Mark Fisher goes on to say, if a weird entity is present, a ghost say, or in this case, the death of a patient, he says then, if this weird thing is present, the categories which we have up until now used to make sense of the world cannot be valid. In other words, the weird thing isn't wrong. If I perceive it, it must be there. Hence, it is my conceptions that must be inadequate. The weird, in other words, is disturbing. Conceptions are disturbed. One's sense of the world is disturbed. If a medical student finds a patient death to be weird, then it seems that the categories structuring that student's ability to make sense of the clinical world are possibly invalid. What this also makes clear is that weirdness is not simply an emotional stimulus. It emerges like many of the, the, the forms of feeling and suffering, which I want us to think about. It emerges not only from an emotional feeling, but from cognitive dissonance. Clinical medicine may feel weird in part because it thinks of itself as a science in order to reassure itself and its practitioners. But this puts its phenomena at odds with its paradigm. Clinical medicine is, to quote Catherine Montgomery in Doctor's Stories, her work on the narrative structure of medical knowledge, and that's her subtitle, it assumes that medical knowledge is narrative in structure. She says that medicine is, clinical medicine is a rational science using interpretive activity. And to this extent, she says, the idealization of medicine as a science offers physicians preparation and support for only part of their task. And I'd go a step further and suggest that there are aspects of clinical practice that are also not purely rational, but are nonetheless essential components of the clinician's reasoning and the patient's expectations and the decision-making of both. And to this extent, attention to the weird, to inexplicable events or entities that when perceived threaten the framework of the perceiver, events like hauntings and entities like ghosts, these may usefully expose gaps in medical training that leave physicians particularly vulnerable to the stresses generated by meanings that resist being reduced to facts. To recognize the weird then may challenge the dangerous expectation by doctors and patients that clinical medicine can or should achieve absolute certainty despite the inevitability of confounding variables because of course, every particular individual end value of one patient is a universe 
of confounding variables. Before going on, I must make one thing very clear. This critique of the perception of clinical medicine as science is not a critique of science or of its methods or of its findings or of the clinical and public health applications of those findings. Normally that should go without saying, um, I'm not quite sure what it's like in Singapore. Um, in this country, sometimes it needs to be said. Um, and I'm also not advocating an approach to the clinic that is wholly constructivist or relativist or mystical, but I am arguing for the recognition that no clinical event can be extracted from the variables, contextual and particular, that complicate it and that generate unpredictability, what Catherine Montgomery calls medicine's radical uncertainty. These variables include, unavoidably and meaningfully, the emotional reactions and expectations of everybody involved. Feeling is a component of healthy clinical work, not a design flaw that should be bracketed out, all of which may seem obvious, and yet doctors are haunted. Here are two more examples, and these are both warnings given to residents from senior clinicians, telling them that they should expect to be haunted. Here's one. You will hurt someone who trusted you to make them better, to stop their pain, to keep them among the living. The stories of these patients will haunt you and be tattooed on your soul. The writer points out the most obvious recurrent regret, the event of an error, a mistake, an isolated instance of unintentional wrongdoing <clears throat> Excuse me, that leads to a bad outcome. But to be haunted is not the same as simply remembering a mistake so as not to make it again. Haunting can't be reduced to a precept like, I must never do that again. Instead, it keeps coming back complete with phenomenological sense memory, like, this is how my patient looked or sounded, and this is how my body felt as I realized what had happened. But haunting need not be attached to an identifiable or rectifiable or avoidable error. Any negative outcome can produce a traumatizing sense of failure, even wrongdoing, that brings its own persistent ghosts. And here's another one, some more advice for residents. While medical errors garner the most attention, everyday medical experiences, like a stillborn baby, a gunshot wound, or a patient who suddenly takes a turn for the worse, also haunt physicians. More than half of traumatized physicians are devastated by an event they didn't cause, and by implication couldn't have prevented. Any bad outcome is, in terms of how it feels for the clinician, on a continuum with a lethal error. They give rise to painful emotions in practitioners who are trained to view emotion with suspicion and even fear. Death, especially when it wasn't 100% predictable, even when it's inevitable, feels like a failure. But even worse, for doctors, feeling can feel like a failure too. I want to share two fictional clinical ghost stories. The first is a short story by the British writer Graham Swift. Um, and I, I should say, I know that, that Graham Matthews and I have talked about this story a couple of times. I, I believe it's one of his favorites, as it certainly is mine. Um, in, it, in the story, The Hypochondriac, Dr. Alan Collins is a primary care physician. And I, I should say, I've used the story um, often in my own work. Um, my, my book on hypochondria um, kind of turned on some of the things in it. Um, and, and what's interesting is it took me about 10 years to realize that as well as being a story about a, a doctor, it is also a ghost story. Um, and that's what I want to think about today. Um, Dr. Collins, Dr. Alan Collins, the physician, dismisses one of his patients as a hypochondriac, despite the patient's repeated visits and persistent complaints of pain. The doctor prides himself on not being tricked into giving the patient treatment that he doesn't need, so he sends him away. But then the patient becomes acutely ill at home, is taken to the emergency room and dies. There's an inconclusive autopsy. The cause of death is never established. And there's an inquest and the doctor is absolved of responsibility. But the death has its effects. After his patient's death, Dr. Collins notices its effect on himself. And he only notices this to himself. He doesn't discuss it with anybody. But he says, I had to overcome, I'm sorry, this keeps jumping. I had to overcome a feeling that something had cracked inside me, that some firm footing 
on which I had previously relied had given under me. I suppose I was suffering from shock and mental distress. So he moves on, he diagnoses what had happened and notice that he has this feeling. And the first thing he says is that he has to overcome that feeling. But a few days later, Dr. Collins glances about his waiting room and sees the dead patient sitting there. At this point, he suffers a complete, probably career ending collapse. This is not or not only a supernatural story about a ghost seeking revenge for negligence. And it's not just a story about a psychotic break and a hallucination. It's also a story about how certain forms of knowledge work within medicine and how doctors are made vulnerable to being haunted and potentially to collapse by the way their training makes them expect themselves to think. And I'll explain. Sitting helpless in his armchair at the end of the story, Dr. Collins thinks back on a formative event from his childhood. As a nervous little boy, he found that the family cat had died and he ran away from the dead cat, terrified. But his great uncle, a surgeon, decides that he'll cure the boy's anxiety. He makes the child watch while he dissects the cat and he describes and explains everything he finds. It's a lesson in demystification. If death is weird, the dissected cat is just structures. And the moral, says the surgeon, is that there is nothing to worry about when you know what is there and you know how it works. And the boy is reassured and inspired, and this is the moment he decides he wants to be a doctor. But it's a dangerous lesson. The sociologist Avery Gordon has written about haunting as the effect of complexity on intellectual disciplines. In biomedical science, as in social science, we discover truths by excluding and containing and controlling. But outside the neatly anatomized edges of each in vitro prosection or each petri dish, there is excess. In clinical medicine, each patient is an irreducible in vivo sample of one. And all clinical medicine is haunted, as I said, by confounding variables. And as you know, in medicine, complications are never a good thing. The danger lies in believing that this is the only or even the primary way that clinical medicine knows its subjects. The danger being this assumption that there's nothing to worry about once you know what's there. Also, the surgeon's lesson about cat anatomy shouldn't be taken as a claim about the difference between surgery and primary care. That somehow surgeons come, work, function differently because they just have to know what's going on inside the body. One of the reasons I think the dissection of real cadavers is so important for all future doctors, and it's something that is not being done as much as it used to. Um, again, I'm not sure how it is um, where you work, but um, I think it's important because it shows. One of the things it shows is that is that there is no individual body that is identical to the body, the human body that is taught. In, in the anatomical textbook, textbooks that every individual body varies from that non-existent ideal, um, just as every patient will have um, anomalies. And dissecting also helps to develop what my, my own students came up with, and this was connected to, to, to where this, this went, this was several years ago, that they, we, we finally decided that one of the purposes of dissection was what it developed in students was a tolerance for weird. We used all sorts of different terms and eventually they, you know, they, they, they came up with that, that it was not only a tolerance for uncertainty or for bad smells or for dealing with, with gross things, but that it was the weirdness of, of, of being in the presence of, of um, cadavers and working with them. Um, and I've been doing quite a lot of work with students um, in, in the anatomy lab, so something else we could possibly talk about later on, thinking about anatomy as a place for the medical humanities. So, when Collins glimpses his dead patient, the so-called hypochondriac, in the waiting room, all the things his uncle could not point out in the dead cat return. Time, change, particularity, anomaly, and life. And Collins is left sitting sadly in his armchair thinking, I don't know. This keeps jumping twice, I'm sorry. there. He thinks, I don't know if I believe in ghosts. As a doctor, in other words, a man of science, he assumes, it is not my business to believe in such things. 
and then he is left with a single certainty. I know very little. So how does Collins' discovery emerge in the real world? In a 2014 study of doctors' lived experiences of patient deaths, Paul Whitehead describes his subjects having memories that spring suddenly into consciousness accompanied by intense emotional reactions and vividly recalled details. Memories, that is, that point to trauma. Whitehead attributes the usual suppression of such memories in part to the fact that medical training does not provide a place for them in professional experience. Remember Dr. Collins saying that he had to overcome his sense that something he'd been relying on had cracked. To acknowledge this would for him be unprofessional and a sign of personal pathology. Even though so-called clinical detachment has been called into question in medical training and the promotion of empathy encourages physicians to attempt to imagine their patients' emotional experiences, the doctor's own feelings seem much harder to find a place for. A pair of articles in a 205 issue of Academic Medicine makes a few things usefully clear. And I recognize that a lot of work has been done on, on, on these questions since then, but these are particularly valuable in the way they provide a qualitative record of the subject's words, medical students and physicians who were interviewed about their reactions to the deaths of patients. Um, and th this is simply the, the, the titles of these two articles. Both incorporate the words of their respondents in their titles. This is just too awful. I can't believe I experienced that. Medical students' reactions to their most memorable patient death. and then. It was haunting, physicians' descriptions of emotionally powerful patient deaths. In both studies, the respondents struggle to articulate what these emotionally powerful and memorable deaths mean to them. And the authors find that the professional context and medical education provided seem to, to give them very little opportunity for thinking about these meanings and how to assimilate them into professional identity and clinical practice. The awfulness and the hauntingness don't really seem to have anywhere to go. One of the articles reaches a conclusion that fascinates me. Practitioners or students who are significantly moved by patient deaths lack support, the authors conclude, for a simple reason. Death and emotion are viewed as negative aspects of medicine. So perhaps the problem comes back to the positive view of medicine, this view sees being haunted as the result of a purely emotional reaction to death, and it sees death as a failure by doctors. And within those terms, it's not surprising that doctors and students traumatized by their, patient, by their patients' deaths can't find help from their medical colleagues or their mentors. The distress that many trainees and clinicians report may lie in the same assumptions that form the terms of these studies, because emotion and death are very different entities. Both are unavoidably inherent in clinical practice. Emotion saturates both patients' and clinicians' expectations and their decision-making, and death is always present, one way or another, as the telos against which most medicine works and which will always eventually defeat those efforts. The harm then lies in trying to separate emotional distress from its cognitive cause, which is the difference between science and patients. Like Dr. Collins's uncle, the study's authors seem certain that emotion, like death and like uncertainty or weirdness, are flaws in the system rather than signs, and that to be haunted is just to fail to suppress or exorcise these irritating traces. Yet ambiguity, ambivalence, and disturbance are central characteristics of all clinical work. In another study, a doctor faced with the inability to save a patient talks about the terror, and that's the word she uses, the terror of how deeply responsible I felt to be competent in that moment. And she attributes her emotion, her terror, not to existential issues, but to epistemological ones. She says, I might never know, and remember Dr. Collins saying, I know very little, I might never know, whether it's that I didn't do the algorithm right, or I didn't do it quickly enough, or whether it was just the moment of fate and there was nothing that I could have done about it, you'll never get a clear answer. And the haunting follows from that sense of not knowing, but at the same time feeling that she's responsible for knowing, for certain. Whitehead observes the obvious but clearly insufficiently communicated truth about medicine, saying, 
Many situations include an inherent ambiguity that makes certainty difficult to achieve. Professional competence for physicians is not easily measured. Unprepared for not knowing, the physician suffers feelings that are in medicine's own response to feeling, uncoupled from knowledge and its limitations. So the feeling of uncertainty, like sadness or anger or terror, is rendered pathological. So here's my second clinical ghost story, and this one is also haunted by the question of knowledge. And it's from a movie which I'm pretty sure you've all seen. One night, Dr. Malcolm Crow, who is a renowned child psychiatrist, maybe a psychologist, but the subject of, of, of drugs comes up, and I'm going to assume he's a psychiatrist, but you can argue with, with me if you disagree. Dr. Malcolm Crow returns home late with his wife. He's just won a prestigious award for his work with mentally ill children. But someone is waiting for Dr. Crow, and going upstairs, he finds an intruder in the bathroom. Dr. Crow immediately responds very efficiently by giving facts. He states the address of his home and he declares that there are no drugs on the premises. But the intruder won't let the doctor use facts to reassure himself. Instead, he says, you don't know so many things. And then he offers to diagnose the doctor's own unacknowledged suffering. Do you know why you're afraid when you're alone? Now the doctor begins to realize that the situation is somehow clinical. And he asks, do you know me? And the patient, because this is a former patient, is devastated. Don't you know me, he says. Don't you even remember your own patients? And Dr. Crow throws out some names and he finally remembers who this is. And he tries to connect. I do remember you, he says. You were quiet, very smart, unusually compassionate, but it's too late. You forgot haunted, sorry, you forgot cursed, says the patient, maybe haunted. And then the terrible haunting cry from the patient. You failed me, he says. Dr. Crow starts to do penance. I'm sorry, he says, if I didn't help you, but give me a chance now. But the patient has a gun and he shoots the doctor and then he kills himself. So I, I think most of you will have recognized this film. Um, it's the sixth sense, and, and what I described was just the first six minutes of the film. And what you can see here is Dr. Crow and um, his, his other patient, the one who's more important through the rest of the film, arguably. This first patient, though, the intruder, we gradually realize has been himself haunted. He sees dead people, just like the little boy in this picture. His pathology is that he is open to the weirdness that his doctor, his psychiatrist, has been trained to disregard, just as Dr. Collins in the other story disregards the weirdness of his so-called hypochondriac. The rest of the sixth sense concerns a detailed elaboration on learning the weird, both for Dr. Crow and also for the film's audience, who at the end, and I won't give the spoiler, but I'm sure you all know what it is, the twist, who at the end have to go back to the beginning of the film and watch again now that they know things that they didn't know the first time. And they'll see things they hadn't noticed before, and they'll realize that they had seen things that were not really there. The viewers of this ghost story, then, are led to restructure their categories around the appearance of what Fisher calls the weird, the out of place, even within the overtly fictional world of the film. And we're led to examine the horizons of our knowledge and our capacity to gather and interpret the evidence of our own eyes. The viewers may not always remember that the film's plot crux is rooted in a physician's anxious and lethal repudiation of mystery. So to end, where does this lead us? Haunting, as Avery Gordon points out, makes a demand. It produces a something to be done. Ghosts need to be recognized in order to be laid to rest, which is not the same as a violent exorcism. They need to be recognized. And then in most of the ghost stories, um, we will find peace. The two academic medicine studies both conclude that not enough is done in medical education or in the practice setting to mitigate the stress caused by what they call emotionally powerful patient deaths. They see such deaths as, quote, opportunities for learning more from senior clinicians 
about the principles of pain and symptom management, about ways to communicate with patients and their families about terminal illness and about self-care and personal coping strategies when caring for dying patients. But what they'd say they're looking for isn't self-telling, the assumption that's what needed, what is needed is more knowledge, more principles and methods and strategies rather than a more fundamental perspective shift. They encourage more debriefing by senior clinicians and debriefing is very important and we can talk about that. And it, it very much depends on what you mean by debriefing and how the debriefers have been briefed in advance. Um, they encourage this, but they conclude that most senior doctors have in general learned not to be disturbed by death. And I think this might also echo with, with what you were talking about in the last session about how the faculty are, are more difficult to bring around to thinking about some of these things because they've been trained in certain ways of thinking. The undergraduate st students um, often are a lot more open to the humanities and, and all the disturbances that, that they can bring with them. Um, but these, these faculty, these doctors have learned not to be disturbed by death and seem unaware that a particular death had been what they call emotionally powerful. And clinical experience, the authors say, appears to attenuate the intensity of certain physician emotional reactions to death. And this makes them unhelpful in teaching less experienced colleagues how to think about the weirdness and how weird it can feel to be a doctor. Jackson et al. say that the focus of their study is on what they call the negative consequences for doctors of coping with the stress of caring for the dying. Accidentally, I think, but tellingly, they claim that the harm is not caused directly by the caring or even by the inevitable grief and doubt that follow from such high stakes and valuable work, but the harm is caused by the coping, by the way the doctors are expected to manage by cordoning off and bracketing out the multivalent and unruly meanings of the work that they do. And perhaps there's a way to reframe this coping that might mitigate those negative consequences. One interview subject describes making a point of memorializing his potential ghosts, saying, I like to say I carry a little graveyard in my head of all the patients who have passed and of all the people I wish I had done things differently for. And when the opportunity comes up, I honor those people. And I know there's a more famous quotation that's rather similar that um, physicians will carry, or, or the good physician perhaps carries a cemetery in their head um, and sometimes go there to pray. Um, there's wisdom in actively remembering, but the authors of the study subtly rework this story told by one of their respondents um, and say it's what he's doing is developing a way to keep the memories of mistakes alive. Is it pedantic of me to say that this might be a misreading of the metaphor? The doctor's not exactly describing a graveyard for mistakes, but for the people affected by them. And the graveyard does not strictly keep what is buried there alive, but rather recognizes that deaths have happened. Graveyards signify closure. They honor the dead who are ideally at rest in peace. This doctor does not seem haunted by the graveyard in his head. Instead, it's a place of both sorrow and resolution. The dead have died. The doctor has resolved to remember not the mistakes, but the value of lost patients as teachers and hence as guardians of future patients. So this morning I was wondering about that doctor that we talked about, that I, I, I quoted from right at the beginning in 2020, struggling with those skeletons um, in his work in the COVID, that the COVID, IC, that his work in the COVID ICU had left him with, um, because, and I will give full disclosure, uh, Richard Leiter, that author, um, was a student of mine. He was completing his MD degree um, at Northwestern at the same time as he was also taking an MA with us, a master's degree in medical humanities and bioethics. So I was thinking, well, he should be a really good example of how the medical humanities are useful to people who go on to be doctors. Um, if haunting demands that something be done, what had he done? Um, and of course, the obvious answer is he wrote. He, he didn't leave those skeletons locked in the closet. He, uh, he brought them out and talked about them at a, at a point early in the pandemic when it was very difficult. Um, I think he was probably under, a, I would imagine, some pressure to say, well, this is good. Um, the worst of this first wave is over and, and so on. And instead he wrote a devastating piece. He refused reassurance and articulated the complex suffering of clinicians while he's still really in the midst of it and in retrospect, early in it. <clears throat> 
So I looked him up and I found that in 2021, he published another piece in the, the New England Journal a year later. And this one's also a ghost story, but I think importantly, it has nothing to do with COVID-19 because it's about a ghost from much earlier in his life that he's also perhaps laying to rest. I think that's the point. Time has passed since the trauma that he describes in the second article, and therefore the ghost accompanies him in a different way. And I think that gives us another way of thinking about haunting. Richard Leiter wrote in this article about the suicide of an intern that he as a resident had been partly responsible for. He'd been responsible for the intern. Um, I don't think he, he may have felt himself partly responsible for the suicide, although he, we, he clearly was not. But I think that was part of the suffering he was writing about. And he describes his initial course of action after the intern um, had, had died. He says, I threw myself deeper and deeper into my job, hoping that working to heal my patient's suffering would shield me from my own. I kept my head down on my way into the hospital each morning, lest I catch a glimpse of Bobby's window. Bobby was the intern. He had jumped from his apartment window. And predictably, this strategy was unsustainable. I couldn't muster the wherewithal to inhabit my role as a physician while also containing my terrifying memories. After rounds, I sobbed in my chief resident's office and I saw Bobby's death as a sign of my failure. I had failed as a resident. I'd failed as a teacher. Bobby was my intern and I had failed him. I was terrified of ever working with another intern. So Bobby, and that's a pseudonym, haunted Dr. Leiter. But maybe here, six years after Bobby's death and a year after acknowledging the incipient ghosts of the pandemic, Richard Leiter has found a way to confront both in meticulously observing and describing his own struggles and also, importantly, calling out the unsustainable conditions that lead to traumatized and suicidal junior doctors. Richard Leiter is building these little graves, these engravings into the story of his own work. And I think what's really important are the two things that he does, observation, close observation, both of what happens and of what he felt, and then description, putting them into words, making them available to be shared and read. So careful attention to what haunts doctors in the uncomfortable space between remorseful memory, I wish I could have saved them, and anxious anticipation, what if I can't save the next one? Attention to that, what, what, to the haunting that emerges in that space might offer an indirect and yet compelling way to develop resilience based on remembering rather than avoiding medicine's inescapable tentativeness and fallibility and weirdness. What happens if you expect and even welcome the ghosts that are always in your waiting rooms? They may not seek revenge. They may be your teachers. Thank you. Oh. Thank you. Thank you, Catherine, for this very informative and wonderful talk. Does anybody in the room have any questions, perhaps doctors or this relevant experiences? Perhaps I... Oh. Catherine, I, th I think you've hit the nail on the head on many, many levels. Um, oh, thank you. I think one of the things that we have in medicine generally is a very sort of positivist i mean you see it in publications you know nobody publishes negative data you deny i mean if you look at iatrogenesis which is the the cause of harm by clinicians it's the in u.s terms it's the third highest cause of death and i'm sure those data that data is not so dissimilar the world over um there is a sort of forced suppression to this, which is unhealthy. I think it goes back to what we were talking about earlier about how um, behavior breeds behavior. And because people haven't consciously thought about this and talked it through, uh, I mean, I've lost four, four of my original year in medical school, committed suicide at various points along the way. Um, not people that I had direct contact with at any uh, at the times, but you know, we brutalize people through medicine and we don't equip them with all the skills that they they might need to navigate it safely. Um, and, and in a 
and there's a lot of discussion in the UK about compassionate leadership and um, psychological safety as a sort of an emerging concept in terms of um, one of my other interests is in sort of human factors and medical error and simulation and high fidelity. And there's, there's a lot of opportunities in these areas. I mean, some of the, the, the work that we were doing was looking at helping people understand stress and distress and how they coped under stress and de-stress through the act of appreciative inquiry and, and, and sort of a human factors approach to debriefing. And, you know, the mechanisms are there, the methods and techniques are there. It's, you need the culture to be there. And that's why I keep coming back to this notion that where we are as a profession and where we are as a healthcare system, and I, I think it's very much better in Singapore than many places around the world, just from my experience. But, um, you know, we're not in the place we need to be to create the safe, psychologically safe environments for people to flourish and rationalise or de- not even rationalise, just uh, live through and accommodate and adjust to all of the many very, very, very profound things that you've, you've, you've illustrated. So, yeah, I mean, I think it's um, this sort of concept of moral injury and psychological safety and the absence of it, um, I think is a really profound bit. I mean, everyone talks about joy at work, which again is a positivist dimension to it. I mean, we, you know, first do no harm is the great adage in, in physicians' um, sort of uh, ethos, but we're quite willing to walk by, or not walk willing. I mean, I think we're ill-equipped to deal with it, or many of us are ill-equipped to deal with it. And I think that's, uh, I think it is an area for, and, and we, we are trying to do our bit with uh, helping people be more self-aware, self-caring, self-compassionate, and the mindfulness movement. We, we put a lot of emphasis on that in our medical student training, particularly in the first year. But again, it, we've got to create a culture that is sustaining and safe for all, not just not just our students. It's got to be for our faculty as well, and, and they're victims of this too. So huge challenge. Thank you for eloquently articulating many aspects of the challenge. And I love the emotive language because, again, that means it's, it, that, that, that means these things have importance or resonance. You know, these are powerful words, haunted. I mean, when you said it, I was just thinking of, you know, I've got a Rolodex of cases and I'm a clinician too. I, you know, I've got a Rolodex of colleagues and patients and, and, uh, scenes and scenarios that just immediately come to the fore and it's we were talking yesterday about getting burnt um you know the intensity of emotional experiences and i i I think there's a lot of important work to be done in this space um and we've but started so thank you thank you thank you um i just yeah i think i i think one of the things that medical humanities can do perhaps most easily in some ways is to is to pay attention to words and stop on words and and unpack them um you know in in any kind of context because um i think medicine trains a kind of uh, and and medical jargon is of course essential and lovely and there, there's a whole you know there's a there's a beautiful vocabulary in medicine itself um, and an efficient and and sort of useful lovely language but but i think there are words that tend to be dismissed as as soft rather than meaningful and you know and or used in a careless way um uh, with this the sort of assumption that um i know what i mean with this word so of course you know what i mean so i don't need to be terribly precise because of course we both know what we mean and and as as a result i think meaning gets lost yeah. Um, and I, you know, and I, th- I think the haunting, it, it, it was, it was interesting to me because I found it in one, one of those quotations that I used and I thought that, and I said, oh, suddenly stopped and thought, that's interesting. What if you took that literally? And then I was amazed at how, how the words all over the place and, you know, so sort of, you know, and then, but then when you say, well, I'm talking about ghost stories and medicine, that immediately sounds like, well, clearly that's silly. Um, mm. and, and yet, it's actually a way to get at something which I think is psychologically you know, quite true um, and, and seems to ring true. Um, One of the other areas I'm quite interested in is sort of leadership and leadership identity development and formation. And I don't know if you've come across any of um, the work by uh, 
Talbot, who's looked at action logics, you know, sort of Kurt Lewin's work on action logics. And one of the problems in medical leadership, and he describes a, a series of transitions, it's Talbot and Rook, as in R-O-O-K-E. Um, I, think he, uh, I think he was out of Bath or Bristol at some point. Anyway, um, they talked about the seven trans transformations of a leader from impulsive through opportunistic to diplomat to expert, then achiever, individualist, strategist, alchemist, ironist. And oh, I like that. Each of each of these different action logics represent almost different and the points I was making earlier about different almost philosophical perspectives. Um, one of the interesting things about medical leaders are the vast majority of them function as expert. So they have this conforming conventional um, expectation of correctness and authority, yes. which again makes the dealing of complex, the dealing with my background, I'm a chronic pain specialist. So mm -hmm. I was working in the space of intractable pain. Absolutely. And yeah. th th this was a nightmare. I mean, most of my clinics would be considered nightmare clinics for most people who were seeking to fix the patient so for experts who want to cure my clinics would be a nightmare but actually that's not the that's not the job at hand the job at hand was to educate and help help patients understand and effectively cope psychologically or physically more effectively with their their predicament accepting that cure wasn't feasible so a little bit like the work that I'm sure Andrew's done in, in, in sort of functional GI conditions. So I, I just think we need different paradigms and the, the, the expert problem solver might work well in, you know, sim simple, conventional, protocolizable healthcare, but it doesn't work. It starts to fray once you get beyond the, the immediate simplicity of uh, directly attributable cause and effect. Which then leaves the, the expert vulnerable to disillusionment, <laughs> um, which is its own kind of harm. Prof Graham, would you like to ask a question? Um, sure, yes. Um, I don't want to take up too much time from the Q&A because uh, uh, I, I've read a lot of uh, Catherine's work before and, and she's always a, a fantastic speaker and uh, the work's always very, very rewarding. Mm -hmm. Um, and, and I think it's, it's a good opportunity for clinicians to uh, engage with some of the uh, more unusual aspects in, in the humanities. Uh, I suppose my question is more about uh, whether we're making, whether we risk making category errors when we talk about medicine. So um, the, the thought here is, is kind of drawing on Catherine uh, Montgomery's work, uh, which you, you mentioned earlier. Uh, there's, a, there's an assumption among patients and probably among medical students, the medicine is a positivist Newtonian science, as, as Ian also pointed out. Um, we like to think that medicine is a science and that it's going to give us certainty and that it's going to give us answers. Uh, and I think we see this in medical students, at least my encounters with medical students, they tend to want to find the right answer um, because they're looking for the knowledge needed to pass the test. And, and also these are students who have been the top scorers throughout uh, the throughout JC. Um, they're, they're, they're looking for the ways to get the correct answer in the tests. They're, they're, they're really, really intelligent, but they're, they're also very disciplined. Um, but then when they graduate, uh, they find that the clinic is very much a place of interpretation, that they're having to ask questions about what is happening with this particular patient. Uh, and they're actually receiving a very, very complicated narrative that they're having to decode and think about. And there's an element of kind of detective work there. Um, and I think a lot of the time in the medical humanities and the humanities side of this, we, we tend to sort of, um, I, I know Rita Sharon does this, we talks about the ways in which um, patients can easily become a statistic for medical practitioners, whereas for patients, it's their entire world. Uh, and I think in, in establishing that, that sort of binary, we do risk forgetting the ways in which actually this is also uh, the world for the for the doctors as well. So I, I really like the way you're drawing out the haunting aspects there uh, and thinking about the ways in which doctors themselves are, are encountering loss. 
Um, and I, I suppose the other thing I'm reminded of is the William Osler quote, um, that medicine is a science of uncertainty uh, and an art of probability. I suppose my concern is that nice. patients don't know this and they're expecting certainty. And, yeah. and uh, doctors kind of know this, but aren't necessarily sharing it within the culture, as, as you point out. Um, and you mentioned that in medical culture, death and emotion are usually seen as negatives. Uh, and I suppose my question really is, how would you reconceptualize this? Is there, is there a way we can rethink death or rethink uh, emotion in, in more positive terms within, within medical culture? Uh, mm-hmm. And I know that sounds like a really weird idea to think of death as something perhaps um, in, in, a, in a less negative way, because it's, it's, the, it's, a, it's regularly seen as a failure state. Um, mm-hmm. But um, I don't know. My 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 grandmother is uh, ninety uh, ninety eight. She is um, she is she does not have the best quality of life, and uh, she recently contracted COVID. And uh, uh, and um, it's the question I'm constantly dealing with is is obviously there's a lot of sadness and loss at someone passing, but it's also she's very old. She doesn't have the same sort of quality of life what then constitutes a good death, what means dying with dignity. And I just wondered if you had uh, uh, some thoughts to, to add to that. Well, there's a lot there. Um, f- uh, first of all, the, the, the quote that um, the, the thing that, that um, uh, medicine views death and emotion as, as negative, uh, that was a quotation from, from one of the articles um, that I, one of the studies I was using. I, I think it's incredibly important for them I mean, the opposite isn't to embrace them, you know, and say, well, death is wonderful. But although one could argue that, you know, if we're taking a narrative perspective, death is the ending of the story. That is where the meaning comes from. There is a sense in which, you know, I mean, we, 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 if, if medicine were to think about, and, and obviously palliative care, you know, is part of, or palliative medicine is part of that, clearly, where you think about, um, acknowledge that death is inevitable and, and medicine can, can contribute to its not being a disaster, <laughs> but to its being, a, you know, the, a natural and meaningful ending of a story. Um, you know, then then death doesn't need to be a thing that a student responds to, a medical student responds to as being, you know, weird and surreal and shocking, but rather as something that is part of what medicine is engaged in. Um, but um, one of the things that we do, which I, um, I, I mentioned briefly, and which might be useful here, is, is working with medical students very early on. Um, gross anatomy um, has for so long been seen as, you know, the sort of rite of passage where uh, stu- the first thing students learn, I mean, I've always thought of it this way, that the first, the first ordeal that you have to pass in order to become a doctor is to cut up a dead person and not be horrified. Right. In order to prove that, you you know, the, there's all this sort of tension around around, you know, making sure that you're not the one who faints or throws up or can't do it or whatever. So that, that there's this initial rite of passage that involves confronting death and not being emotional about it. Um, that seems to, pr- in some ways, set up all of those expectations. And so the thing that I mentioned briefly in my talk, I did a seminar with a group of medical students and we went into the anatomy lab. You know, several times, and then I also had them sort of think in different ways about about what they were learning. Um, and at the end, um, we looked at the the objectives for the medis for the anatomy course, and the, the sort of teaching objectives were all you know you will be able to recognize structure X and 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 you know stick a pen in it or name it if we stick a pen in it and so on. And I looked at you know we sort of looked at all these objectives, and I said to the students. Um, so does dissecting a cadaver teach you these things? And they said, well, no, not really. We learn those from the anatomy textbook. And, you know, dissecting helps us, you know, get some sense and at least prepares us for the, the practical exam when you have to find them in the cadaver. So I said, well, you know, so would it be better if you just learned anatomy from a textbook? And they said, no, not if that we, it's really important. Um, so I had them then establish what objectives they thought actually dissecting the cadaver did achieve. And it was, it was, it was, extremely interesting to me i mean this is how we came up eventually the sort of summary summary was that what what it taught them was tolerance for weird um but within that were things like recognizing that no individual dead person no individual person dead or alive perfectly matches the 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 normal the structure that they get taught um, and that there are always surprises um and that the anatomy lecturer will often find surprises that structures don't look the way they expect them to or don't you know follow the the normal pattern 
um, and that every patient has every every cadaver, every patient has um, a variety of of different things, and then that working as a team, you will you will identify different things in different bodies, and that um, as a team, they will think they'll, they'll, you'll fail at times and not find the thing that you're looking for, um, and then someone else will sort of. I think one of the things the students said was you can. You can you can dissect and mess around and and destroy structures you were supposed to identify, and then all of a sudden you find something that you hadn't expected and realize that you know what it is and it's completely awesome. And they will kind of laugh, you know, the, the sort of idea of 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 that process of both um, experiencing something that is incredibly difficult in a context of recognizing the dead. Um, as something other than a disaster, but as something that can be learned from um, and recognized and respected and so on. Um, and also at the same time, working as a group, as a team, tolerating the horrible smell, the, the general disgustingness, the uncertainty, the, the sense of, of, of wrongness and disturbingness of what it is that they're doing, but at the same time, recognizing why they're doing it, that it has a clear purpose. So there, you know, I mean, that, that just as a sort of idea of one possible intervention um that they're doing anatomy but they're that but but the students themselves were able to recognize that what they were actually learning from anatomy were things that fit completely into what we we think about as the medical humanities um even though those were not the formal objectives of the course and i think that might be the way that you know some of what you you have all been talking about can be worked in by just having that shift in perspective and sometimes the students will will pick that up faster than the faculty do Sorry, that was an overly long answer. Thank you very much. Uh, I, I think Andrew now has a, has a question. Yeah. Hi, so uh, firstly, uh, thanks, Katrin, for that um, presentation. So I just wanted to share a bit about my own uh, perspective about how medicine is being taught these days. Uh, I think it's, it's, it's inherently going to be a, a, a problem. Um, be, uh, so uh, I think, as I think Ian mentioned before, that uh, medicine has become more of a science. Um, as, especially as evidence-based medicine becomes pushed in the forefront of, uh, um, so it's, um, and, and the medical schools are trying to include, um, certain things in the curriculum to try and, uh, retard that progress, but it's, a lot of it's undone in the hospital, uh, clinical setting where there are no role models doing the same thing. And so, because in, in my subspecialty, I, I deal with functional GI disorders. So I deal with patients who have been stigmatized by other physicians because they just couldn't prove that there was an organic problem in the patient, even though the symptoms are entirely real, right? And it's because medical school for centuries have taught that the mind and the body are separate. As the moment you have learned pathology and you can prove histopathology, a disease is only a disease when you can prove it under a microscope. Oh, so, mm -hmm. so, so symptoms are not real just because the patients say it and you can't prove it, you see. And and the medical students are, are treating diseases that way as well. And so when they see a patient in, in a clinic, they try to solve the problem. If they can't solve it, it becomes the patient's problem, not their problem. And and that becomes an issue because my patients are often frustrated and they are often stigmatized. And, and what I've learned over time is that I have to treat them as a human being first. I have to try and, and, and get out of my shoes as a physician to be a human being, understand what they're going through, and then try to use whatever little information I have to make their life improve. It can be through pharmacological methods, it can be non-pharmacological methods, whatever it is, my goal is to try and help them. So it's, Hippocrates once said, you know, you, you cure sometimes, you treat often, you comfort always. But we tend to turn it the other way around. We, we try and solve the problem and we can't solve it. it. It's not our problem. It becomes the patient's issue. And, and I'm not sure if this kind of thinking will actually change over time because I think a lot of the medical schools around the world, um, they still they still teach medicine in that way, and the role models that the students have in the in the hospitals are doing it that way as well. And, and so, it, you're fighting against a tide, but it's still an important thing to to actually um, fight against because with telehealth, with um, electronic records, I. I the patient physician relationship is really strained in its worst state now than it has ever been. Uh, and, and we have to do something about it, at least within the sphere of influence that we have. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, it seems, it seems incredibly sad that you, 
and 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 this is not unique to you at all obviously that you say that you you know you you're functioning as a physician and then you have to try and deal with the patient as a human as though those two things are separate i mean they they really shouldn't be right i mean doctors are people um and you you know that the, 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 there's something as i say there's something sad that that there should be a sense that that rift is you know at the sort of starting point of professional identity um I, maybe i'm unrealistically up Optimistic. I feel as though that tide, that evidence-based medicine tide, is uh, is has. There are openings. I think. I know. I another of the possible benefits of of the of the COVID pandemic, perhaps, is that um, at least for some, I think there's been a recognition that science, the the, the expectation of science being, you know, be able to provide a, a unitary single answer, uh, rather than being something that. Uh, recognizes that it's learning and gets it wrong and then gets it better and improves and you know as we've seen with changes in public health for example I yeah I, I don't know um, maybe as I say I'm unrealistically optimistic but I think one of the crucial differences is between um, you know when you talk about evidence-based medicine you're talking about statistical probabilities with the largest n value possible when you're dealing with a single patient your n value is one and the evidence is what the patient brings and I think in, in teaching, I think that distinction, again, between biomedical science and clinical medicine um, is really important. And I think if, if that's something that students um, are reminded of, or, you know, if, and again, you, you need faculty who can do that, um, then I think that can be helpful to, um, to get past that, 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 that sense of, you know, of, of what you're describing. And obviously, in in the field that you're in, the patients that you're working with particularly have have been through all of that. And um, yeah, it's a particular. I mean, my my work on hypochondria, hypochondriasis, but very deliberately not hypochondriasis as a psychiatric diagnosis. But the, what happens when a pa when the patient says, "I am sick," and the doctor says, "There's no evidence of organic disease," and the patient says, "But I am still sick. What are you going to do?" And how that is such a terrible challenge. To medicine um and it shouldn't be it should be well then what are we going to do because you feel sick therefore you are sick what are we going to do um i think it's sort of a similar kind of argument to the one you make thank you uh, dr ravine hi uh Catherine, thanks very much for your talk um you. maybe i just want to share my own personal experience um especially the what you mentioned about the anatomy lab and dissection room. So, I mean, I, I spent about 20 years in Ireland. I did most of my medical training in, in Dublin. And my medical school was a very old school style. Uh, what you've probably seen some of the old Hollywood movies. I mean, our dissection room is about 200 years old. So we had uh, our gray haired professor of anatomy who essentially oversaw the anatomy teaching, who happened to be an ex ENT surgeon in a former life. And, um, Again, we, it was spread over two years, and of course, we had a not an agenda. We had a syllabus or curriculum, like over the first year, you have to do the dissection of the various parts of the body. Mm -hmm. And uh, I suppose now, as a medical educator, and uh, twenty years hindsight, a lot of the things which were taught was not a lot of things which was not explicitly stated in the curriculum is what we would call the hidden curriculum. I mean, we had a very international bunch of medical students, quite a lot of Canadians, uh, Americans, Australians, and we'd have the guys who come into the anatomy lab and uh, with their baseball cap, which was almost surgically attached to, to them, a lot of them. And I remember one day in, in, during the dissection class, he actually whipped it off the head and threw it on the floor. And he actually said, when you come into the dissection room, you need to respect the dead. No hats in the dissection room. And even, I mean, we were all like 20 something medical students then. And sometimes you, you know, sometimes be informal and joke. And again, he was very adamant that, you know what, the anatomy room is a sacred place. And if you want to take your joke, take it outside. So again, it was never sitting in any of our guidebooks or etiquette in the DR. But again, I suppose that's what we would call the hidden curriculum. And what was also very interesting, I'm not sure they do it in Singapore. We used a lot of cadaver cadavers for two years, one year for head and neck, another year for the rest of the body. And at the end of the two year cycle, right, they would have a, a memorial service for the cadavers. 
and all the family members of the the those who donated their loved ones' bodies to our medical school. We'd have a, a, a memorial service. Uh, we as medical students were invited, but not everyone attended, which I thought was a very good uh, way to, you know, they're not a piece of meat, you're there. Of course, it's better to see it in real life than in a, in a, in a textbook. But I think that really drove home, like what some of the things you were saying. Mm -hmm. uh, they are there to teach us, but they are also, they were somebody's father, grandfather, child, and on a second note, again, I, I'm a pediatrician. So, and where I trained in my, I mean, Ireland's a Catholic country. So all, all the hospitals there had a chapel, a hospital chapel. And I remember we had a, like a, like a school register. Any child who died had their name put into the register, be it whether you're Hindu, Muslim, Jewish, it didn't matter. And every year we'd have a memorial service for all the children who had died. Uh, in the hospital, which I thought was like, it was very, very good. And again, I, I'm a Hindu, but I attended it every year. And uh, and a lot of times you'd go during lunch, but you'd actually see nurses, doctors, just spending some quiet time in the hospital chapel. And uh, in fact, I, I left there in 2010, and the demographics had changed a lot in the 20 years I was there. And in fact, uh, the hospital chaplain, the last year I was there, asked me to help not co-organized. We every year we had it in the hospital chapel, but the one year we had it in Dublin Castle, which is a big public civic building, and we had a multi-denominational service. So she asked me to say a prayer, a Hindu prayer, obviously with an English, but a Hindu prayer. We had a Muslim colleague, a Jewish colleague. So, and I think that brought a lot of closure for us doctors as well as all the parents of the children who had died the year before were invited to this as well. So again, I'm not sure. I mean, if this is done in. Uh, any of the hospitals in Singapore. But again, I just thought it was a very beautiful way of putting into context what we do. And death, is, it's, it's part of the job. Uh, I don't think we go to medicine knowing we can cure everyone. Uh, but I think this really, really helped. Maybe I think at the time as a junior doctor, as a senior doctor, I may not realize it, but I think now, now that you had talked about it and I'm looking back, I just thought it was incredibly important and powerful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, Dr. David? Hi. Uh, yeah, thanks, uh, Catherine, for the amazing talk. I, I, I'm, I'm actually a psychiatrist, right? So I can really relate to, you know, all the discussion about hypochondriasis and, uh, oh, right. and, and what um, Andrew shared as well, right? I mean, um, so psychiatrists are often the last stop, right? <laughs> when, uh, you know, uh, our other colleagues can't diagnose anything and uh, there's unexplainable medical symptoms. And, um yeah, we, we see so much, um, uh, you know, distress, right, in, in these patients when they come. It's almost as if they've kind of been written off with all the frustration from all the other clinicians uh, they've consulted, right? And uh, there's, that, there's always that niggling feeling of not being understood and not being heard as well, right? Uh, mm -hmm. And the stigma, right, of, um, you know, having been told that all your kind of medical investigations are unremarkable, we can't find anything wrong with you, so you know here, here you are. Go and see a psychiatrist. Right? Mm -hmm. And um, I think when it comes to doctor patients, doctors as patients, it it it, it comes to a whole another uh, uh, dimension. Yeah. And I recall it. um, I, I have some uh, uh patients who are doctors uh, right? and um, it, I recall a recent incident with uh, uh this this um doctor patient of mine who, you know, the, the story was really compelling because um, uh, basically, like, um, you know, she's quite a senior doctor in the mid-career and um, she, she spoke with a lot of pride as well about how, you know, she, she's really good at her work. She's very resilient. She's gone through a lot in her earlier life uh, to come where she is and um, she's, she's a capable person and in her day-to-day her -day work, she's fine. But, um, everything started to unravel when she went for a minor procedure and had an un, uh, unexpected uh, complication that's really not common, right? And, um, and thereafter, she had this persistent niggling pain that wouldn't go away, right? And, um, and that whole feeling of uncertainty and frustration that, you know, I've treated so many patients and this is like 
nothing to me, right? I can make diagnosis with the snap of my finger, with all that clinical experience that I have, but yet I can't figure out what's wrong with me and this pain just won't go away. Right? And that made her incredibly depressed to the point of actually even having, you know, suicidal thoughts. Right? And I think that that story was really, you know, so compelling and so moving and I could totally relate to it when you were sharing about, um, you know, the... Um, the story that the uh, the hypochondriac, right? Mm-hmm. And I think that that term is something that is so uh, stigmatizing, isn't it? Right? Uh, and so much so that actually in in the the DSM fifth edition, right, it's been kind of renamed it's as illness that. anxiety disorder. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, so, it's too stigmatizing. Yeah. 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 So thank you for sharing that. It's something that I think you know, as a clinician, as a psychiatrist, uh, it, it's something that we really relate to, and I think it's something that um even in the medical schools as well, is something that we really should do a whole lot more um, to, uh, you know, to, to kind of break that, that whole notion of the mind-body divide, right? Because um, mm-hmm. uh, that, that's, that's, you know, that's why when medical students rotate through us as well, uh, you know, we really as psychiatrists in general hospital, uh, you know, try our best, right, to kind of uh, destigmatize and uh, to, to kind of um, uh, explain the intricate links, right, between the mind and the body, right, so that when many of these, um, you know, young, young uh, future doctors eventually graduate, right, they don't carry and perpetuate this stigma. Mm-hmm. Yeah, it seems like the, I mean, the sort of classic medical student illness, right, where students often find themselves developing symptoms of the, the conditions that they're studying seems like that should probably be a, an opportunity as well to instead of you know having them feel st- stupid or sort of go to the doctor and then discover that you know it was all in their mind and they're you know sort of be embarrassed by that that you know that that seems like that would be a really interesting opportunity as well you know if to sort of invite students who who develop that to actually you know think it through and think about why you know why your body would do those things why your body mind your mind body would do those things and what that might mean, which might also develop, you know, help develop a sense that, that patients, you know, the same thing happens and that um, unexplained symptoms cause as much suffering as explicable ones, maybe more in, in, in a lot of ways. And, and I, I think the problem again is that doctors are taught to be, um, to be, you know, which is why your, your case is, is so interesting that doctors are taught to be um, um, really, Challenged, sort of outraged by by symptoms that don't seem to have a you know an, a reliable um, expl- organic explanation, and and what follows is the sort of vulnerability that doctors you know I mean the doctors do not you know the hyper so called hypochondriacs are doctors' least favorite patients because they complicate um, you know the, the 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 structures of thinking um, they they're threatening to medicine. If medicine depends on you know being able to find the answer and 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 cure the disease rather than alleviate suffering, um, and so yeah, maybe maybe students should be encouraged to to speak up if they develop symptoms of <laughs> of the, the diseases they're studying. Maybe they should be you know become teachers. But thank you. Um, yeah, I'm yeah. Uh, I'll, I'll put a small plug in for my book if you're interested. There's there's more there about that. I think the other thing they they should hear more often than they probably do is, you know, senior clinicians acknowledging and accepting the complexity of real patient predicaments. And you know, I can remember the first time I ever heard a professor say, I don't know. It was mm-hmm. profoundly uh, illuminating. What do you mean you don't know? You know, there's, you're supposed to know everything. And, you know, <laughs> he, he very eloquently explained all the reasons why, it couldn't be X, Y, Z, and so, so on, so on, so on. But he said, you know, this really is an unusual set of symptoms, presentations, contexts. And, but I think it's important that we do convey uh, complexity and ambiguity and comfort with it and what we do in those phases. Because you know, if you go back 200 years or so, most people died of one acute illness in their mid to late 40s, according to the general stats. Now they're more likely to die at 85 with six, seven, eight comorbidities. Uh, And so there is going to be an infinite level of complexity. And again, one of the problems is we're trying, and we spoke about this yesterday, we're training everybody to some greater extent in silos. So we're training uh, mods and sods, multi-organ doctors and single-organ doctors, and there aren't many 
multi-organ doctors left. I mean, there's the, the, the family physicians and the, um, uh, you know, the, the more generalist specialists. But most of the time you get a renal consult, which contradicts the cardiology consult. I mean, I, I'm trained in chronic pain, but also anesthesia and intensive care. And, you know, the, the, the irony of that sort of biomedical through to a psychosocial spectrum is massive. Uh, yeah. And, you know, when single organ doctors only take responsibility for an organ, not not the whole patient, you've got real trouble because, you know, they will advocate for the treatment that works best for their organ, but they don't really care if it causes trouble for the for another distant organ because that's not, not, not their problem. And, you know, this sort of reductionist, transactional, granular uh, ethos of um, everything can be broken down to its constituent and elements and understood uh, and is is all known it's clearly not true and there's much more beyond uh you know at a genetic level and at a psychological level and at a sociological level um you know the the, the, the manifestation of pain for instance i used to work in the east end of london you know, we had 168 different languages and dialects and but every one of them had a different socio-cultural concept of pain, um, pain. Uh-huh. you know which was profoundly interesting ultimately um, overwhelming, but fantastically complex. And it meant you had to do the N equals one piece and just under, try and understand and link into whatever uh, stories or experiences the patient was relating or perceptions and, and meet them where they were. And I don't think we do that anywhere near enough in healthcare. Mm-hmm. And just very briefly, the... Um... You reminded me one of the other weird things that my students um, discovered um, in, in anatomy lab was that those, those, those special separate organs, discovering that kidneys are really embedded in all the other stuff and you can't really always separate them out and sort of thinking, well, why, do we, why are we just studying the renal system now? And then why is neuro separate and why is GI not, you know, and sort of recognizing that those are artificial distinctions too. And that when you look at the whole body or the whole patient, um, you know, you can't always tease out those parts that they actually affect each other, which, again, is completely obvious. And yet medicine tends to forget about that, too. And, and th- this lack of a holistic approach yeah. or this diminishing la- sort of holistic approach is creating problems because, you know, if you turn it around to be more person centred, you would try and coordinate all of that better and, and better integrate um all of the involvements so that it could be shared and jointly share, shared and explained. And again, IT is a pretty good example of that where you know, one, dot, one team would come in and give a conflicting opinion to another team. And the intent as intensive care, we were left trying to explain this to families <laughs> and the individual the if, if they were conscious. And you know, it's, it's actually very hard to because it does look for what it is a, a, a fragmented granular reductive approach which doesn't look like it's treating the whole person and, and right. you know I don't know we've, we've I think we've got ourselves down a rabbit hole with all of this specialism super specialism and reductionist thinking we we need to sort of it's what I was saying earlier about it's it's not black or white right or wrong transactional or transformational you've got to take the best of both and try and you, you know, the the greater value, the greater whole, is the integration of all all of the things that are useful. Not not just to deny that um, the psychological, the sociological isn't important. It is, but it's easy to do so if you just treat everything as a biomedical widget or a right. you know some molecular or cellular structure. Mm-hmm. It's and, the and ultimate I don't in, dehuma- in, in dehumanizing people. You know, to see them as receptors and uh, molecules it's it's very dehumanizing dehumanizing sorry yeah no and i I think it's really important also to recognize that that set that you know the sort of holistic view there's always a danger of like oh we're going to do this holistic mystical you know and forget about the science and it's really important that the the two are not in they're they're not in conflict you know obviously you know the 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 bio biomedical science is extraordinarily extraordinary and has done wonderful things and there's no giving up that no one would want to and evidence based medicine is incredibly valuable it's just that it the and and I think part of the trouble is that it that that model is threatened by 
the alternative and doesn't need to be. Um, but that means that the, yeah. the, the sort of the overall view of what the clinical of what clinical medicine is, as opposed to biomedical scientific research, if they're seen as two different things and the one uses the other, um, then I think that that sense of of, vulner- of science's vulnerability within the clinic yeah. um, shouldn't it, it doesn't need to be there. But I think the training at this point. But like in all areas, there are the evangelists and the um, mm-hmm. egotists and the the people who are adamant that their way is right. And I think that's also a big part of the problem that you know, there are some... And that's because- science almost becomes a religion if that's not too philosophically contorted a, a, a view because it's a belief system. It's like any other belief system. It, mm-hmm. It's got some... And that comes back to what you said. It's it's being stuck on the expert level. It's because you're terrified, you know, because you don't see that there's anything beyond expertise, yeah. and therefore, if you make it's, a mistake, it's also very it's also a very fundamental part of your identity. Yeah, it's and being if, right. If it fails, if it fails, then you have to perhaps try and consider what might be better, and that's mm-hmm. uncomfortable for a lot of people. Mm-hmm. Yeah, Fantastic. iron. I, I want to see that this going to the the last step, as you said, the ironist. It seems like maybe more irony in, <laughs> in the training would be healthy. Well, it, that's what ambiguity is about. Right, of course, you know. yeah. Uh, and actually one of the definitions of the strategist level is that can cope with multiple paradigms all at once and navigate and uh, cope with um, uncertainty and complexity and ambiguity. And there's a lovely phrase that they talk about, which is called passionate detachment which is an ability oh, to be in the moment, but to also not be, like I was just explaining you, totally paranoidly invested, you know, evangelically yeah. invested in something. Right. It's, it's right. being able to say, yeah, this is useful and I'm committed to it, but there might be room for improvement. And I think that's the, the, the pragmatic part about it that I think is quite refreshing. But you know, the expert has to keep believing because they're conventionally conforming yeah, to... The evidence, you know, the, unless it's a randomised controlled trial, show me the randomised controlled trial that demonstrates that what you've just shown that this morning is of any legitimacy at all. Uh, you know, this is what this is what you get. Show, show yeah. me, the, show oh, me yeah. um, confidence intervals and all the rest of it. Yeah. Where's the Where's your outcomes data? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, um, Inku. Do you have anything to share or ask? I just play around with that emotion oh, process. With <laughs> I had to try a few times before I got the correct one. Um, yeah. Um, well, I think um, I'm reminded of a few few points uh, when I when I saw the presentation. Firstly, it's about uh, regret and guilt. So I, I posted an article uh, which wasn't really directed into health uh, for healthcare providers, but it talks about regret and how it was actually harder for someone to regret in terms of not having done something rather than regret after having done something. And, and I, I seem to be uh, reminded of that when you spoke about physicians uh, actually being haunted after patients die. And, and it's really about regret on either misdiagnosing or, or not diagnosing something and or maybe even giving the wrong treatment. So I do wonder whether uh, one is worse than the other, but, but probably they're equally distressing uh, as well. The other concept that came up was actually about guilt because um, I think despite the many complaints that we have in terms of our jobs and all that, I think as a societal, cultural kind of perception, we are in quite a privileged uh, uh, situation and profession. And it's quite hard to see the world around us actually collapsing, whereas we are you know, still having a job, having quite a steady income and, and all that. So I do wonder how much of that kind of survival guilt actually contributes to how haunted we are when we see our patients crumbling around us and your family members are struggling as well. The other thing about the COVID situation is that the concept of uncertainty is actually very obvious and it spans across to healthcare workers as well and even to the government. Yeah. Uh, the, the reason that we complain is, is because the government themselves are also not certain about what to agree on, right? And that trickles down and actually in, in, um, affects us in the end. So I think uh, the concept of uncertainty might actually have the opportunity to be elucidated and discussed in these current times. It, it might in fact be an opportunity to bring up uh, the, the entire identity of the profession. Um, the last point I wanted to make, which is actually 
about being optimistic as well is that some of the terms that were brought up about demystification, which is really about normalizing death, normalizing grief, normalizing uh, grief in healthcare workers. Sometimes we say there's this um, enfranchised grief, right? You know, you're grieving, but actually society doesn't recognize that you're grieving, either because, uh, you know, you're the third party of a marriage, you know, the, you know, the second wife coming to a funeral of a patient who has died, but actually nobody knew about the wife. And he, she just had to leave after a while. The kind of this enfranchised grief actually can be uh, supported. And this is really what the social workers, the therapists, the art therapists, the music therapists uh, do as some of the processes, uh, which David might be um, aware of as well. So there, there is a glimmer of hope in that sense. There are resources uh, possible. And, and I think that fits very well in terms of how we actually cope with such grief and loss by increasing awareness by advocating for, for the groups who actually have a, a lesser voice in the society. And what Natalie mentioned about actually social media has played a big role as well. Yeah, so really a lot to think about. <laughs> I think really thanks, uh, Catherine, for bringing all this up. My pleasure. Yeah, those are, those are great, great points. Um, I mean, I think, I think physician grief, I mean, those sort of connections between, between regret and guilt and grief are, are complicated. I mean, I think I think tr students need to learn that that um, you know when your patient dies, you may not need to feel guilt or regret, even though you're sad that this has happened, and that also that you may be grieving, um, and that that is also you know legitimate. Even though I think I, I mean I think I think there's this sense, and you often get this with the humanities thing too. You know, if you if you were haunted by every patient of you, yours who died, you clearly would burn out. Um, or if you if you grieved every patient of yours that died, whereas in fact it seems that you do grieve them and you are haunted by them, and what is harmful is not knowing that that's happening or feeling like you're not supposed to, um, and that and that the rec you know recognition of that and recognizing that that feeling is part of being a physician rather than something that you have to bracket out um, would I think you know. It, seems like it shouldn't be that hard <laughs> um and yet somehow there's a sense that that yeah the whole profession will break if you if you allow those things in um but i'm optimistic other... that it's changing i'm sorry yep sorry no i was just gonna say that i I'd spent some time as a professional regulator in the uk at the gmc and one of the problems with fitness to practice investigations was you'd sometimes find that um you know, not surprisingly, the medical profession is, and I'm sure all other health professions are filled, not filled with, but have their fair share of personality disordered individuals who are sociopathic or even psychopathic or narcissistic or uh, OCD, you know, again, and, and some of those traits actually aren't bad. You know, an OCD anaesthetist is not a bad thing to have, probably. It, the question is whether they can sustain that intensity of you know, hand washing and all the rest of it. But, um, you know, if you think about the most, one of the things that we were finding was that surgeons have a, a not in all characteristics, but obviously there is some, quali some qualities of sociopathy that actually suit surgical practice quite oh, well. Yeah. You know, emotion, emotional yeah. detachment, control under pressure, the, you know, a little bit brave, um, I'm not so sure narcissism helps and I'm not so sure that um, rebelliousness helps particularly because then they're less likely to comply with rules. But you do see these patterns of behaviour in and amongst all clinicians to some to, to some extent. So, you know, there's a, there's obviously a sweet spot. You, you couldn't dissolve in tears every time you put a scalpel into somebody. So, you know, you need yeah. a degree of resilience and uh, emotional detachment, uh, uh, but it it becomes problematic when it becomes um, pathological, which, again, is part of the challenge. How do we protect patients from people who have um, perhaps two, three standard deviations from normal patterns of behaviour? And, and that's, that's the other part of this as well, because some people don't get moved by these things and they're, they're almost impervious or oblivious to. And that, that, that what I'd say, is almost as problematic as people being burnt out and um, challenged by it all. It's, but it's more important than ever that we talk about all of these aspects of psychology and behaviour. It's really important. 
Thank you. Um, I'm a little cautious of time as we're eating into lunch. Um, thank you, Catherine, for your presentation oh. and the really great discussion that has emerged from it. Does anybody else have any last words, or Catherine yourself, any last words you'd like to share? Well, I just want to say thank you for the great questions and discussion. And, and uh, yeah, this has been a real pleasure. So thank you very much.